Uh, so yeah, welcome to the team. Hey, thanks, thanks. <laughs> uh, hi guys, uh, sorry about the delay. Uh, some technical issues there. So my name is Sahil. I'm one of the Fizos, a new Fizo at UFIT One North. Um, today my uh, presentation will be on T-Pallis posterior perinopathy management. So a little bit of myself. <clears throat> so I'll just, just uh, go through what we're going to go through today. Um, we're going to talk about the background of uh, T-Pallis posterior perinopathy or TPT. We're going to talk about the anatomy or review the anatomy. We also have um, I'm going to do some literature review as well and talk about the theory of uh, angular of function. And then we're going to also talk about how do we manage uh, patients with TPT. And I'll share with you one case study that I actually have uh, in my current case. Loop. So a little bit about myself or my physio journey. I did my uni at the Trope University in Melbourne uh, from year 2014 to 2017. And um, during my studies, I was a uh, sports medic in various football codes uh, from rugby union, rugby league, uh, EFL, and also touch football. So during that time as well, I started or restarted doing uh, no gi jiu jitsu and also played uh, touch football for the university. So after graduation, I first worked in NUH uh, from 2018 to 2021, and my first rotation was in uh, acute auto. Subsequently, in med search and pediatrics, uh, thank God for that. It's only less than, uh, I think, 14 months or so. And finally, was uh, in the MST and sports outpatient department where I focus on post-operative um, uh, patients. I was also part of uh, Singapore Wrestling Federation and actually grappled for Singapore in 2018 for the Southeast Championship. Um, the the event is uh, crafting under 62 kg. So currently I'm at UFIT One North. I'm also the physiotherapist for Singapore Taekwondo Federation because our timing uh, uh, and seeing patients uh, and started working for the Singapore Taekwondo Federation as a physio as well. My timing doesn't really work out. So I can't, I stopped doing uh, Jiu Jitsu and grafting and actually picked up uh, uh, Olympic weightlifting. <coughs> Go and um, okay. So can you, you can see this right? All right. So um, Tevalis posterior tendinopathy, right, or TPT. So foot and ankle problems are prevalent in the general population, and some studies show that one out of five people actually report foot problems to their GP. So common, you know, foot and ankle conditions uh, affecting. People include uh, osteoarthritis, which is about 12% uh, of the population over the age of 50. 37.5% uh, have hallux bugus or bunions. Plantar fasciitis or fasciopathy, uh, which um, is prevalent in about 3% of the older population. And also we have tendinopathies and symptomatic flat foot or fast planus. So the term uh, flat foot or fast planus is commonly used to describe um, uh, feet with absent or abnormally low arch, which is often associated with um, eversion of the rear foot. So it's estimated about three to 25% of adult population have pest penis worldwide, but not all are symptomatic. So the pest penis in adult population, it can either be flexible or rigid, or it can be congen congenital or acquired. The condition where um, the flat foot is acquired in adulthood is termed as adult acquired flat foot deformity, AAFD. So wide spectrum of etiologies have been proposed for AAFD, uh, such as uh, neuropathic causes, uh, arthritis, um, traumatic, or what we call dysfunction of the tibialis posterior tendon or PTTD. So PTTD is characterized by the pain uh, localized on the middle side of the midfoot uh, to the rear ankle, and yes, uh, and is associated associated with difficulties with activities that load up the tibialis posterior tendon. So in the literature, PTTD and AFD may indicate um, different pathology, but in the current literature, they are news like. Inter interchangeably by a lot of clinicians. Um, 
but there are clear distinct um, uh, pathogenesis uh, regarding it. So PTTD, the first classification system was proposed by Johnson and Strom, which is way back in 1989, who described um, the who described a three stage three stage uh, classification system detailing the progression of the tendon dysfunction and structural deformity. So signs and symptoms in the early stages, like stage one, stage two, are primarily tendon related. So it's mostly pain plus swelling but it can progress to a fat foot deformity that is associated with failure of the soft tissue structures. So the authors use two primary clinical signs, namely the single leg heel raise and the two many toe signs with the, we're looking at the forefoot abduction. So in the figure two, if I'm not sure if it's blur now, um, this is the, the signs that they use too many toes where you can see the, um, the, the, the lateral side uh, you can see the toes sticking up. So Johnson and Strom uh, also highlighted the operative management of the various three stages. And you can see, uh, you can see uh, stage one, even as early as stage one, yeah, the, um, the operative management included you know, tendon debridement, but later on you will see that at stage three, the operative management included like subtalar um, arthrodesis or, or fusion. But subsequently, in 1997, which is almost 10 years after the initial three stages classification, uh, Myerson introduced stage four, thereby expanding the classification. In stage four, the degradation of uh, ankle joint are also present, since the recommended uh, management will be a tibiotelocalcinal tibio arthrodesis. Okay. So you can see in the, in the x ray here, although this one is likely. Um, traumatic in nature. Um, tibio, tibio telecarcaneal fusion is uh, very extensive and you can you know, see from the x-rays how limited the range of motion uh, of the ankle joint is. So, you know, if, and with this new classification, you can see that um, the surgeons, even at stage one, uh, are, are open to doing osteotomies. Um, to the ankle, even at stage one. So what's the difference between TPT versus PTTD? So we can, um, so it's understood that PTTD can be a progressive and debating condition as they go through the various stages. However, at the early stage, uh, namely stage one, stage two, the signs and symptoms are usually related largely to the tibialis posterior tendon only. So you can see pain, you can see swelling, you can see weakness with uh, or difficulties with activities rather than the ligamentous, osseoligamentous uh, involvement in stage three and stage four. So hence in this case, uh, TPT, also in the literature, they refer to as the early stage of PTTD. So unfortunately, surgical management has been historically been the forefront of the intervention, right? Uh, despite little evidence to support their efficacy, um, and majority of the um, published literature uh, is low level in nature, mostly level four, with no RCT trials existed. So surgical techniques range from you know, cyanovectomy to tandem remitment in the early stages, down to osteotomy and fusion in the later stages. So, and outcome assessing uh, these invasive costly procedures uh, is, uh, targeted at the level of body structure, meaning they look at the correction of the structural deformity rather than activity or participation, and therefore do not actually consider overall functioning of the, of the individual. And furthermore, like with all surgeries, um, there will be risk following it, including infections, mal malunion, nonunion, uh, wound healing problem, DVTs, uh, neurological trauma as well or even under or over correction. So to facilitate best outcome with non-operative approaches, uh, it's vital that non-operative approaches are targeted and efficacious. So this is also you know, uh, more important when surgical intervention is recommended after an uh, unsuccessful trial of conservative management. So due to small sample size, low response rates, and uh, 
uh, and actually in early days lack of consistent definition is uh, difficult to find uh, it's difficult to find and interpret data as well however some key factors can be found to be associated with uh, tbt namely you know, hypertension dm previous steroid, previous steroid use and uh, uh, negative uh, arthropathies so in a sense, it's also probable that it's the combined effects of all these systemic disease, aging, and increased body mass that could contribute to the failure of the tibialis uh, pusher uh, tendon and as well as the uh, uh, AFD deformity. <clears throat> so what are the clinical features that are um, actually used or recommended? So some or seen rather would be tenderness on palpation of the device posterior tendon. There will be swelling over the medial ankle, uh, flexible as uh, a flexible flat foot. Flexible meaning that uh, when it's flat uh, and standing, when it's flat and standing and weight bearing, the arch actually um, drop. But when it's non weight bearing, it's actually uh, uh, when the arch actually returns. It could also, uh, you can also see reduced inversion strength or difficulties in um, performing single leg heel raise. So what are the role of uh, imaging for TPT? Um, radiographic confirmation of telinopathy as a whole is not required. Uh, a study by Mills uh, et al. in 2020 also showed that 67% of participants without any pain showed some tendinopathic changes to the tibialis posterior tendon. So there's no correlation between pain or no pain and tendinopathic changes. However, it's still used routinely in uh, clinical practice or clinical research just to evaluate any grayscale tendon changes, uh, otherwise known as uh, fibrillar disruption or changes in tendon size. Okay, let's review on the anatomy. So we always uh, remember in school, the mnemonic uh, Tom, Dick, and Nervous Harry. So it refers to T, D, A, and H, yeah? So posterior tibialis, flexor digitorial longus, posterior tibial artery, and then nervous will be tibial nerve, and hair flexor hallucis longus. So the nerve supply for the... Um, Tibialis posterior muscle is from the tibial nerve, uh, which gets their in, um, which gets their roots from L4 to S3. So the tibialis posterior muscle is a multi planet muscle, so it's uh, best suited for eccentric contraction that resists lengthening and also limit tendon excursion range over a short distance. Yeah, so um, sort of limiting limiting motion. So it originates from the proximal posterior lateral and posterior middle aspect of the fibula, uh, tibia and fibula, and also the interosseous membrane. And the pathway mid portion is situated deep in the deep posterior compartment of the leg and runs proximal to the medial malleoli, secured by the um, flexor retinaculum. And also in textbook wise, is, uh, insert, uh, it shows that it's inserted in the navicular bone and the medial cuneiform. But you know, as we all know, there's always variations of um, you know origin and insertion in everyone. So, but only a few studies actually documented this uh, variation. So one of it is by Bloom uh, and colleagues in 2003. Um, as you can see from figure one, that's the normal sort of um, uh, the consistent with the textbook. Uh, but in figure two, you can see that there's a distinct slip. Uh, from the anterior band of the posterior tibialis tendon um, down to the abductor hallucis. Yeah, so, and it's found in five out of 11 cadavers that they uh, tested, um, tested, I guess, tested in. And this actually, the, the author actually um, suggests that this might be, uh, this distinct attachment might help to increase the power of the abductor hallucis as well. Some other variation you can see is that the posterior band, uh, figure three, of the posterior tibialis tendon um, 
consistently shown that he has an attachment to the spring ligament as well. And seven or 11 specimen uh, can see in figure four actually have, have a slip down to the fifth uh, metatarsal base. So all the way down to the uh, near the lateral side of the foot. So, and it can be some anywhere between the second and fourth as well. Yeah. So based on this origin and its attachment, a various attachment, we can actually see that the role of tip pose is to pump up and to invert the ankle as well to abduct the toe, uh, the toes. But in some bio and in some biomechanical studies, such as uh, Ricci, yeah, in two thousand seven, it's found that they they see that they found that the tibialis posterior muscle is the strongest rear foot inversion moment um, of all leg muscles. So. At the same time, they also found that the tip post uh, muscle is actually the weakest ankle plantar flexion moment. So, some their studies also also show that um, some of the tip posts uh, demonstrated the shortest tendon movement and is average about two cm. So, with that, the author actually proposed that with this low uh, excursion movement the tip post can actually produce high forces on the multiple uh, insertion of the foot with minimal, despite minimal tendon movement. And they sort of um, discussed that this might mean that any changes in the tip length, tip post tendon length could cause uh, a loss of uh, function. So other than moving the ankle in um, uh, open chain, they, the tip post actually have more important role in weight bearing. So it, it, the tip post tendon is actually a key dynamic support of the middle longitudinal arch of the foot, or some call it the MLA, or the uh, literature, they call it MLA. By actually inverting and plantar flexing the foot, it actually locks the mid tarsal bones, yeah, making the hind foot and the mid foot very rigid. So understanding this, uh, is very important as it clarifies the role uh, of how dysfunctional tibialis posterior has in the development of the uh, of a PTPD or acquired flat foot. So to understand, you can use uh, the mechanics of truss uh, that uh, if you see if like uh, bridges or tentage, they use this truss uh, metal rod thing, uh, you know, to support structures. So one of it, uh, so to uh, actually explain how the truss works. So a truss has um, two sides yeah, of, uh, of the triangle that makes at a fixed, uh, fixed base that actually binds them together. So when load actually applied to the apex, yeah, the struts are subjected to compressive loads and the tie rod, the tie rod at the bottom is placed under tension. As the end of the struts, yeah, is stabilized by the tie rod. It cannot be separated at the top. So if you can, if you can think of it, the diagonals and the vertical truss actually carries the shear force, and the bottom cord carries the bending over here. So therefore, the length of the base of the triangle remains constant. The, the forces are, I guess, dissipates. So applying that in the foot, right during weight bearing, the foot actually acts. Like a as a truss, whereby the tie rod mechanism is provided by the plantar uh, aponeurosis. So the tip post runs through the middle side and locks the mid tarsal bones, making the hind foot and mid foot rigid by the plantar flexion and inversion action. And now it acts like struts, yeah, and thereby absorbing any compressive forces down. Although they are, um, you know, uh, passive structures. Uh, that may hold the mid tarsals in place, it's likely that without the dynamic stabilizing force of the tip pose, the integrity of the arch is compromised. <clears throat> okay, and this could be seen actually by study by Kamiya uh, and colleagues in 2021, whereby the author placed cadavers of the lower leg under cyclic axial loading. So after 10, 1,000 cycles, yeah, the group without uh, any firing using the servo motor of the tip post slowly had their middle arch collapse. 
Hence, we can see from here like how the dysfunction of the tibialis posterior muscle, as time goes on, the, they slowly lose the arch to, uh, as the arch slowly collapses. And the heel drift into a valgus and the forefoot gradually abducts, which invariably result in painful acquired flat foot. And we can't talk about you know, PT, T, uh, TPT without understanding uh, tendon uh, pathogenesis. So the purpose of tendon is to transmit forces uh, generated on the muscle to the bone to elicit movement. Yeah? So tendon are structured in highly organized hierarchy. So we have the collagen fibril, yeah, which are aggregated to form collagen fibers and then aggregated again to form uh, fascicles. And then these bundles of fascicles forms the tendon. And surrounding the, the collagen fibers, there are sheets of uh, kinocytes uh, and they are responsible for the maintenance of the extracellular matrix. So the tenocytes response to make mechanical load of the tendon does make a adaptation as well. So they are arranged in longitudinal rows and have extensive communication with adjacent cells. Okay, so um, little is known regarding the actual mechanism by which uh, healthy tendons accumulate damage and then how the intrinsic and extrinsic compartment uh, activate and coordinate tissue remodeling. So this um, uh, uh, theory by Sidecker and Poland um, shows that how chronic tendon disorders um, with the progressive accumulation of uh, tissue damage, the tendon reaches a metabolic tipping point. Yeah? So this tipping point is reached when the metabolic demands of the tendon exceed the available nutrients supply of the normally avascular core. So basically what it means is that the current load may be accumulative, is uh, exceeded the tissue capacity to actually recover. And this is uh, <coughs> uh, further explained and um, uh, refined by Professor Jill Cook uh, in her tendon continuum model. So Crohn, other than overloading as well, chronic understimulation of tendon cells can also produce uh, a catabolic uh, gene expression that can also result in extracellular matrix degradation and subsequently loss of tendon material properties. So under the popular Jill Cook tendon pathology continuum, we can see how um, tendon can be chronically underloaded and thereby stress shielded. And in this way, previous no, previously normal load will be considered excessive to the individual and bring about uh, changes to the tendon. So it can be overuse and underuse, such as the car signal. <laughs> so let's look at um, uh, the current literature review or the limited literature review, actually. So the first one, let's, um, this is a case study by um, 2015. Uh, case study by, uh, what's wrong with this? Okay, case study by um, a few um, physiotherapists from um, US. So it's about a 23 year old female collegiate. So I think this, this one, basketball player and a runner or this two. So this um, physio uh, mostly uses uh, passive dorsiflexion stretch, uh, soft tissue mobilization, elastic taping. And what is shown here is a cuboid width manipulation and also eccentric exercise to help um, recover a patient from middle ankle pain. Okay, so nothing interesting here. It's just a case report. It's very low uh, in uh, hierarchy of evidence. Next one, uh, another case report, uh, a low level evidence as well, but this time around a case report and series. So I think, uh, I guess lately as well, um, uh, shockwave therapy has been um, popular among in the management of tendinopathy and other uh, soft tissue conditions of the foot and ankle. Yeah, uh, radial shockwave therapy is a low energy form 
uh, that can perform safely. And uh, I think in, in, even in Singapore hospital, they use uh, radial shockwave, uh, whereas the extra is by the, um, by the doctor, right? So in this uh, case series, the shockwave uh, therapy was provided over a minimum of three sessions, plus minus one, depending if the patient has um, a positive response, but not a complete clinical uh, response. So the, the patient will be performed, the shockwave therapy will be performed either in prone or supine, with the preferred method being the uh, supine with the leg externally rotated. This way, the doctor uh, were able to access the more proximal portion of the feet post and apply the um, shockwave therapy. And the current, um, I guess, protocol in use is the um, threshold will be uh, 1.8 under 15 hertz for a total of 3,000 pulses. So other than the shockwave, all the patient as well was a prescribed food strengthening program uh, based on the food core principles. So this includes uh, what they call phone doming, food doming, where you sort of like train up the parts of the feet um, and also can be done uh, by you know, pressing the toes into the, the ground or even dragging the ball towards the heel or, or the towel towards the heel. Um, and they also, be taught to do toe yoga where they just go up and down with the toe and toe abduction and adduction. They are also um, uh, been given a single leg balance exercise, uh, standard tibialis posterior bended exercise, calf raises, as well as even you know, hopping and landing. So it's actually pretty um, uh, so called uh, comprehensive, right, in terms of exercise. And um, yeah, and uh, um, no, all this exercise is performed in uh, barefoot as well. So in this case report, they do see an improvement in the uh, outcome measure using the foot and ankle, uh, what kind of FAM in the ADLs and sports score. The next one is, um, we can look at is uh, effect of eccentric exercises. So, the purpose of this study is to actually investigate the morphology and vascularization of the tip post tendon uh, before and after a 12 week program consisting of uh, uh, 10 weeks of progressive ex uh, eccentric exercises. There's also level four case series studies. And um, the patient reported outcome measure includes a single leg heel raise, five minute walk test, and ultrasound imaging. Um, again, the patient reported outcome showed uh, improvement within the groups. Um, but in the ultrasound imaging um, pre and post, there are no uh, changes uh, to be seen. Uh, both pre and post is, um, remain abnormal in the ultrasound finding. And is that um, surprising? Not really, right? So uh, a systematic review uh, by you know, Chris Littlewood uh, and colleagues, uh, suggests that even when exercise is considered as a whole, there are conflicting evidence to suggest that uh, there are any changes to the, to, to the structure. And lastly, there's only one uh, RCT that you can find uh, on Tibalis posterior uh, tendinopathy. So in this randomized control trial, uh, there's 39 patients with uh, um, stage two PTTD randomized into either orthotics and stretching or orthotics stretching and strength strengthening. And the food and the outcome measure news for the food function index, the short uh, MSK function assessment. And they also want to look at the isometric uh, deep posterior compartment strength at initial six weeks and top weeks for all outcome measure. <clears throat> so results within group improvement between group uh, differences very minimal and actually isometric strength, there's no difference, even though uh, there's an improvement in function. Okay, this is, the, this is how they actually calculate uh, the deep posterior compartment strength uh, using four plates. So what are the exercises that they actually use? Uh, for the stretching group, they use uh, wall 
calf stretch and uh, supine active range of motion exercises. And for the strength group, they use uh, bilateral heel raises, they use uh, ankle and foot uh, inversion with a bend. They also use um, uh, unilateral uh, heel raises as well, other than bilateral heel raises. And so what other, uh, so in terms of, um, yeah, so they did stretching and strengthening, but both had the orthotics. So what do we know of orthotics or, or even taping? Is the, or other biomechanical intervention is that uh, this study, which involved 10 asymptomatic individuals using uh, low dye taping or anti pronation taping, some, some uh, people call it. So, what this found is that what this study found is that with the new using of the tape, it actually increases temporarily the medial longitudinal arch and uh, reduce the reduction of T valley's posterior activity. But it, we need to uh, bear in mind that this study is in asymptomatic individual. So how do actually all these people get better, right? Because uh, you have um, uh, strength training, but there's no increase in um, strength tests. There's no improvement in the strength test, but they do still get better. So how do we actually um, explain uh, how did they get better? So one theory we can use, uh, or one theory that actually explains everything is that the envelope of function theory. <clears throat> so the envelope of function theory was initially developed by Dr. Scott Dye in 2005. Uh, and he explained how uh, he used a tissue homeostasis model to understand PFDS, or patellofemoral pain syndrome. So he explained that uh, any tissue is in homeostasis, and it's doing that to maintain a constant physiological condition of its internal environment. So although our tissues are very successful at self-regulation, sufficient disruption of homeostasis can result in pathophysiologic uh, changes or processes. So instead of uh, considering PFT from uh, 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 a true structural failure, Dr. Dai actually um, look at how these pathophysiological processes actually occur due to sudden bouts of uh, increased training loads or stresses. <clears throat> so the envelope of function theory, so he uses this graph or he proposed using this graph is that homeostasis can describe as a zone or envelope of function where the tissue is capable of tolerating loads, which is around, which is this line here, the envelope of function. So this zone is established through chronic loads to which the related structures have adapted in response to the incremental exposure. So an acute increase in training load or load is just exceeded in the established, already established envelope on function are thought to disrupt uh, this homeostasis resulting in pain, which you can see uh, here where he wrote zone of supraphysiological overload or even zone of structural failure. <clears throat> so once this homeostasis uh, tissue is disrupted, the associated structure may no longer tolerate uh, levels of loading, even during routine activity. So if let's say this, uh, this person here, you know, envelope of function is to you know, uh, jump two meters, uh, play two hours of basketball, anything that um, disrupt the homeostasis will bring the curve to the left. Yeah, so <clears throat> because of that, um, previous routine activities, such as like, you know, walking downstairs or running distance, uh, previously well tolerated running distance, are no longer able to be tolerated by the body. <clears throat> so the goal of the intervention will be to, at, this, uh, at the initial point, is to reestablish homeostasis, possibly through temporarily altering load such as in this case, using low tie daping or orthotics. So this is where biomechanical intervention, such as bracing and taping, could potentially have a role in improving outcome. So in the whole sense, the clinician also will, will be uh, able to uh, plan 
a rehab program that actually incrementally uh, restores the patient's envelope of function. So the central uh, tenet of envelope of function is to uh, <coughs> uh, is to sort of like show that high tender loads are not uh, primarily dangerous, rather than they are trying to uh, the author is trying to say that uh, the load actually exceeded the tissue's condition capacity that may be uh, potentially injurious. So management of tendon. So using, again, using uh, Jill Cook's uh, continuum uh, model. So our main goal is to ultimately increase tissue capacity. So at that current moment, the <coughs> uh, tibialis posterior current capacity is lower than the load. <coughs> so <coughs> this is where you need to um, adjust uh, the current load, the training program, uh, specific to the patient's need. So there are actually no cookbook or protocol, but there are some guidelines that we can use. Okay, this. <clears throat> All right, so this model here is by uh, Peter Maliaras uh, and actually put it, uh, Jill Cook as well. So this is the phases of telenopathy rehab where there's uh, phase one to phase four. And this is actually in line in, you know, the uh, as a, with, uh, um, conventional SNC principles. So phase one um, uses a lot of isometrics, phase two isotonics or strengthening, phase three focus on uh, dynamic movement and energy storage, and phase four mostly sport specific. So phase one and phase two, you will rarely um, have someone who is so um, uh, sensitized that you can only do phase one. Uh, so usually we actually combine phase one and phase two together. And the main goal at this initial stage is to in decrease pain inhibition using isometrics and increase uh, uh, MVIC uh, incrementally. And usually phase one and phase two, we use a lot of uh, heavy, slow resistance. Uh, uh, for myself, I actually use a lot of tempo training uh, using utilizing a slow three second up and three second down to promote the uh, uh, adaptation. So stage three, which is uh, dynamic and energy storage, uh, is the reintroduction uh, of load training loads that um, is critical to increase the load tolerance of the tendon and also can be used as a power progression to return to sport. So initiating this stage is uh, based on, uh, the, according to author, um, based on having good strength and having good load tolerance. How do you determine having good strength is um, not very clear cut. Uh, in this uh, article, is mostly related to patellar tendinopathy and they use uh, the single leg leg press about 150% of the body weight. So in terms of tip post, we can use uh, single leg heel raise as your, your gauge, whether or not they have good strength and good load tolerance as well unless you have uh, some form of uh, standardized procedure to actually uh, test the strength. Uh, if you know one, let me know. I want to use that as well. And um, and this stage, it will be involved you know, jumping, landing, uh, deceleration drills, acceleration drills, change of direction, and so on. And lastly, uh, stage four is the sport-specific sport stage or energy storage and release stage. In this stage, there's more um, you know, replication of sport specific demands and graded uh, return to training. Do all the patient with uh, TBS posterior tendinopathy require this? Uh, other things so, most of them don't actually play sports. Uh, so yeah, you can even uh, uh, stop at phase three and just use uh, a maintenance program to make sure that their load uh, tolerance is stable. Okay, um, so I have one case in uh, my current uh, load uh, with TBS posture tendinopathy. So this patient here, he's a 35 year old male who's a marketing manager and he's uh, worked from home since um, uh, circuit breaker. So he's a new cyclist, uh, a 
I guess during circuit breaker, he picked up cycling and he's a, a regular breeze walker. So he has this three year history of uh, right middle ankle and foot pain with no traumatic incident uh, and has a uh, in, uh, insidious onset. So some of these uh, acts includes uh, prolonged standing, prolonged walking and running like from the get go. And uh, some of the easing factors is just rest for him and avoidance. So he did an MRI and he found uh, degenerative changes to the tip post tendon. So he's been seen by three different physios in Singapore. So two in Singapore, one in Europe actually. So three different physios. And most of his uh, intervention was previously ultrasound, dry needling, tissue mobilization and exercise therapy. And what he described exercise therapy is mostly a banded exercise uh, and really low level exercise where he was taught and just uh, do it at home and come back in four weeks or so. Um, of course, uh, why he came here is like, he, it's not working out from him. So at best for him, he can hike up to three hours while he was in Europe, all outdoor. And, but at initial contact, uh, when I first saw him in August, he can only walk up to 20 minutes before onset of pain. However, during cycling, there's no uh, issues with him, uh, with the ankle. And ever since circuit breaker, he put on 15 kg. So overall, his main goal is to go for more than one hour walks uh, with his wife and family. And he also wants to, you know, uh, go hiking outdoor as well within, during overseas. <clears throat> so in assessment, I uh, can see, uh, if going through the list, I can see uh, uh, mild flat foot, uh, but he's also using insoles uh, which he bought off the shelves. He's also uh, slightly overweight. So grade-wise, no issues. Uh, similarly, he is, he can perform 12 reps before the onset of some mild pain uh, in the middle ankle. Squat, mild valgus, but generally um, not uh, significant to me. Uh, single leg uh, balance is less than 30 seconds. And during palpation, you can, uh, he, uh, he reported some tenderness on the deep post insertion and just behind the uh, medial malleolus. Range-wise, PROM, EROM is pretty good uh, within functional limit. Uh, Strength-wise, I only use uh, MMT, no specific tests or no um, uh, I guess uh, reliable strength measures to use. Uh, muscle length test, there's a reduced uh, knee to wall over the right side, uh, 8 cm compared to left, uh, 10 cm. And as special tests, I use the penal test just to rule out any uh, uh, neuropathic or, or neurological you know, involvement. Outcome measure that I use is the lower extremity, lower extremity functional score, uh, which is score 85%. And some of the uh, 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 lowered score includes like running, hopping, and changing of directions. Okay, this is the exercises that uh, we use or I use with him. I'm not saying this is the right one. Maybe you have a different approach. So first saw him 12th August. Um, and uh, after assessment, you know, physical assessment, subject history, I only had uh, 15 more minutes to work with him. So we start off with very simple um, exercises. We started with isometrics, uh, started with seated heel raise, uh, where I use 20 kg kettlebell, put it on his lap, uh, on his knees rather, and do heel raises from there. You'll be surprised that actually, you know, you can really load up people in this position. Uh, it can tolerate well with isometrics and heavy, heavy, uh, heavy load over there. We also started uh, some banded ankle inversion and some uh, mobilization with movement, uh, ankle dorsiflexion, uh, to improve the uh, to improve the uh, knee to wall test next time. So um, some of the exercise program you see some X and all that, but actually I think he uh, he completed it. I just don't think he actually put a tick. So initially I see him um, twice a week. Uh, and subsequently, I see him once every two weeks uh, as he gets better and can perform the exercise as well. So other than the exercise where we try to uh, improve um, the load tolerance, I also um, um, give some advice on how to restart, you know, brisk walking. I initially started uh, with 20 minutes first because that's what he can tolerate. Subsequently, uh, uh, saw him uh, saw him last week. Uh, he can tolerate about 45 minutes before you know you feel some uh, pain in the middle ankle. So it's still work in progress. 
uh, following week we work on you know more uh, more loading uh, we, we do wall seat heel raises uh, we started doing split squats uh, just to push the ankle into the range and also um, prepare him for more uh, prepare him for more um, i guess uh, squatting movements in future <clears throat> And then this was this uh, last week. I saw him last only once last week. Uh, yeah, we progressed uh, to um, double heel raise uh, using the uh, safety squat bar uh, up to 40 kg. Then, yeah, 40 kg. Uh, we also started the uh, early plyometric phase. So we started doing box jumps you know, and a bit of pounding drills. Um, just to uh, bring you back to the phases of rehab. It's not exactly where you go phase one and you jump off to phase two, jump off to phase three. There's always a sort of like a bridge where you, you, know, you put some of that phase three exercise with phase two and slowly actually um, build them up from there. Yep, so um, yeah, he's due for uh, re-evaluation. Uh, should be about two more weeks and then uh, we'll see how we go from there. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, you know, TPT is a potentially a debilitating condition. It affects uh, lifestyle and participation. And uh, most of the um, targeted approach will be exercise therapy using the tissue homeostasis model. So do consider the activity limitation and progress accordingly and improve their envelope function. Cool, and uh, that's it. Any... One has a comment on the on the exercises that I choose. All right, all good. So um, yeah, you can give me a text if you ever need uh, to ask me anything. Thanks, Ahil. That was a nice presentation. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of information bombs. That's nice. I need to process it again. Like the, it's quite interesting. The trusses mechanics and things like that. I like that. Yeah, it's so interesting. Right? For, yeah, very interesting. So uh, I've recorded this um this sharing. So I'll just send to the WhatsApp chat again. But if anyone has any questions, you can shoot now. Or, you know, just personally uh drop your message to Sahil. And uh, yeah, thanks, Sahil. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, asking if anyone has um, you know, some methods of um, recording strength. Do let me know. I'm yeah. always uh, uh, keen and interested in you know, uh, using outcome measures that are repeatable and yes. uh, quantifiable. Anything that's better than uh, manual muscle testing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so thanks, team. Uh, the next thing we have in mind will be uh, Dr. Allen for next month. So stay tuned for last Thursday of next month. Cool. Anything else, Sahil? No, nope, I'm good. Okay, thanks, team. Have a good one. Thanks, Sahil. Bye. -bye.